piece, Nick. Um, Great, thanks so much. <clears throat> Um, and I'll just begin by saying thank you very much for inviting me to uh, to speak to you today. So, um, yes, this is going to be a very discursive talk. Uh, basically, I, what, what I'm going to speak about is how um, our team at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine used our sort of COVID-19 model to feed into policies around the roadmap out of out of lockdown in the UK over the course of 2021, focusing on how we captured uh, behavioral changes stemming from uh, the policy changes that occurred over that time period. And when I say it's going to be discursive, I, I guess partly <laughs> what I mean by that is that I don't mean to present this as the sort of ideal way of modeling behavior uh, by any means. If this is the way that we decided to do it under extreme uh, time pressure and you know lack of resources and in some cases lack of information and emotional distress you know over the course of 2021 so this is how we we decided to do it but, but um, uh, I think if it, we didn't like come into this way of modeling behavior all at once it was a result of like multiple changes over the course of the last two years and um, I, I think if you were to sort of design something from the ground up, you might do it a bit differently. But anyway, I just I, I still think hopefully this will be um, an interesting sort of discussion of, of how we ended up doing this. So <clears throat> uh, just to set the scene, you know, where, where we're starting here is at the end of 2020, where uh, B117, also known as the Alpha variant, emerged in the southeast of England and spread rapidly uh, across the country. So we've got this figure here showing from October 2020, with the kind of darker uh, areas showing the proportion of uh, B117 among all cases. And you can see that into November and then December, the spread was extremely, extremely rapid. Um, to, to cope with, uh, and this also resulted in a, a big surge in, in hospitalizations and in death. So uh, to deal with this, um, the spread of B117, the UK government um, brought in restrictions towards the end of December in the southeast, uh, east of England and London, sort of prohibiting people from gathering uh, for Christmas. And then as B117 spread over the rest of the country, um, instituted the third national lockdown uh, in England on January 5th. So this meant that um, all schools were closed, um, all non-essential retail was closed, and there was a stay-at-home order uh, imposed on individuals. And this was to try and prevent the, um, the surge in cases from getting uh, any bigger. Uh, following this, the government needed to come up with a plan for how to bring the country back out of lockdown. And so in, in consultation with um, scientists advising the government, they came up with this sort of four-step plan and a sort of gradual reopening uh, of the country, is sort of how they, they outlined it here. So at step one, which was scheduled for the 8th of March, schools would reopen. And then um, at step 1B, so on the 29th of, of March, this sort of stay at home order ends, outdoor gatherings are permitted again. Um, at step two, uh, scheduled for the 12th of April, non-essential retail reopens and pubs and restaurants can serve people but outdoors only. And I think there was also this rule that you couldn't order alcohol unless it was with a substantial meal. Uh, step three, 17th of May um, was when they scheduled most businesses to reopen, including um, indoor entertainment venues like cinemas. And also people can now be served indoors at, at restaurants and other hospitality venues. And then finally scheduled for the 21st of June, step four, would remove all legal restrictions on si uh, gathering sizes um, and with no requirement for, uh, for wearing a, a mask uh, in indoor venues. So the way this is structured is that each step is essentially five weeks later than the previous step. And this five week period was chosen um, because essentially uh, that was deemed to be a, a sort of enough time to view the impact of each stage of progressive relaxation um, in the most lagging indicators, so hospitalizations and especially deaths, and also to give um, a bit of a buffer zone for the decision to be announced prior to it being made. So um, the government's uh, 
policy was generally to announce the week before a given step would be taken uh, to confirm that it was going to be taken or to, to say otherwise. And basically the, the way this is structured is that each step was sort of subjected to like a go or no go decision based on these four tests. So one that the vaccine deployment program is continued successfully so that you know the, the rate of vaccine output has been maintained. Um, the second test being that evidence shows the vaccines are effective in reducing hospitalizations and deaths. The third being um, that infection rates as they currently stand would not risk a surge in hospitalizations following the next step, which would put unsustainable pressure on the NHS. And the fourth test being that the assessment of the risks is not fundamentally changed by the emergence of any new variants of concern. And it's really these sort of latter two um, aspects of the four tests where the, the modeling came in to um, basically present to government potential scenarios for what would happen after the next step being taken. And that fed into the decision making by the UK government around whether to take each step. So that's kind of the background. Um, what we kind of faced, what our big challenge was for producing this modeling evidence for the UK government was how to capture um, human behavior in response to policy changes. So I'm just showing here, um, you know, the, the trace from the UK dashboard of hospital admissions over time since the roughly the beginning of the pandemic. And just to emphasize that, you know, this has never been a sort of straightforward uh, bell-shaped epidemic curve. You know, at various times, we've had extreme um, shocks to um, individual behavior, which have resulted in uh, large decreases or small increases in transmission. And capturing this, um, <clears throat> this pattern of behavior that leads to this um, sort of shape of the epidemic is, uh, you know, something that we kind of struggled over how to do quite a lot um, and changed our approach multiple times during the course of the uh, pandemic. So I'm gonna show you where we ended up, but again, just to emphasize that it's not necessarily where we, where we started. Um, where we did end up, <clears throat> oh, well, mentioned briefly how the sort of model works. So um, I'm talking about um, a sort of standard SEIR um, age structured uh, transmission model here. So our model is um, split up into five year bands. So from zero to four, up to 75 plus. Um, it's fitted independently to uh, seven different NHS England regions uh, within England. And the component of the model dynamics that I'm gonna focus on here is this transition from susceptible individuals to exposed individuals, which depends upon this uh, force of infection parameter, lambda. So lambda in turn is, um, the subscript I here refers to the age group of the, um, of the focal individual, where the subscript J refers to the age group of their potential contacts. So it's this kind of uh, normalizing constant, which represents the age specific susceptibility to infection mm -hmm. times the sum overall age groups of this CIJ, which is the contact matrix. So the rate at which um, an individual of age group I makes contact with an individual of age group J um, times the probability that that individual in age group J is infectious. I'm simplifying the model structure a little bit, but this is essentially how it works. So in turn, that contact matrix CIJ is the sum of four other matrices, the standard you know, home, work, school, and other, uh, which I think goes back to at least a polymod study from um, a couple of decades ago. So you've probably, <laughs> If, if, uh, you, if you've done sort of modeling in this area, you're probably familiar with this idea of the, the homework, school, and, and other contact um, matrices. But I've, I've sort of just drawn them out here to show the main features. So the lighter the squares are, the more contacts um, between a given age group and another age group. And the main features are that there's this really strong age assortative component, um, especially in the home setting you know, probably with siblings um, at school, so with classmates and in other venues. So 
typically with friends. Work is a bit less age assortative, but there's still a bit of a component there, just reflecting the people, the fact that people sort of mix generally at work. And the other notable factor is this um, off diagonal element in the home contact matrix, which corresponds, of course, to, to parents generally. So that's kind of how, how that works. But the question is, how do these uh, contact matrices change over time over the course of the pandemic? So what I've, I've drawn out here, plotted here, is the, the polymod uh, contact matrices that were collected um, for the UK, I think, in 2006, so not during any sort of pandemic period. And what we want to know is how the intensity of these contacts changes over time and how we can use um, those changes over time to project into the future, uh, depending on certain scenarios of how contacts will evolve in response to policy. So the way that we chose to do that was by using um, Google mobility data. Um, so this is a data set that is collected in sort of uh, many different countries. Um, I think the majority of, of countries in the world based on um, individuals using Google Maps and other um, sort of Google products on their smartphones. And what it tracks at a very fine grained um, spatial scale is the number of visits uh, over time to um, settings of different categories. So it's broken out here into six different categories, grocery and pharmacy, parks, residential, retail and recreation, transit stations and workplaces. And um, I've shown here the sort of data for the UK from the beginning of the pandemic all the way up to, I think, uh, last month here. Now, our interest in using Google mobility data to inform contact rates was really sort of driven by three main factors. One, that the data are frequently updated. So they do three updates um, weekly and usually uh, you get the data up to like a couple of days before it's released. So that's kind of handy because it means you can respond very quickly to changes in contact behavior. Um, it's very high resolution due to the number of individuals that it's based on. So you can be fairly confident that the changes over time aren't driven by you know, sampling noise, but um, are relatively reliable. And also just the sort of question of scientific interest of can we use this kind of automated um, data, which is um, you know, produced sort of um, on a regular basis uh, by Google or by other uh, companies who collect this sort of data as part of their normal um, you know, business interests uh, to track um, contact patterns over the course of an epidemic. Um, you know, there's a few interesting features to point out here. The obvious one is that you can really, really see the impact of the um, first lockdown in March 2020 here on all of the metrics. Um, the November lockdown also comes out very strongly, as does the January one, and you can kind of see contact behavior gradually returning to normal. So given that we wanted to use this data, we still needed to derive a relationship between these data and contact rates. So in order to do that, we use the COMIX survey, um, which is another project at, at the London School, and it's an online uh, panel run by uh, Ipsos Mori of several thousand respondents who are asked uh, each week um, to fill in a contact diary. So uh, who they encountered that day, how long they uh, made contact with them for, where contact is defined as either a conversation lasting of, of more than three words or physical contact uh, and those individuals ages as well as well as the participants age so this allows you to reconstruct um, contact matrices over the course of the um, epidemic but we decided not to use uh, comix data directly out of a kind of worry that the data might be a bit too noisy for that purpose um, and instead, we, we kind of looked for the patterns that related um, COMIX data in terms of the number of mean contacts in each of these four settings to Google mobility data or to other patterns. So in two cases, we decided in the end like not to tie any of the um, mean numbers of contacts 
uh, to Google Mobility data because there didn't seem to be an obvious pattern. No. So for home contacts, um, it looked like they had kind of settled at a pretty stand, uh, constant low level throughout the pandemic. So this is weeks of 2020 here on the x-axis. So we just decided that this was probably mediated by the lockdown occurring, and we'd assume that home contacts kind of remained pretty much constant over the course of the pandemic. I should say we're using as our, our like pre-pandemic baseline polymod, um, which is from 2006. So it's a little slight bit out of date, but the COMIX uh, surveys only started in kind of late March. So we had to rely on that for um, pre-lockdown. Uh, school contacts, we, we noticed basically followed the obvious pattern of being low when schools were closed and high when schools were open. So we just went with that. Um, but for work contacts and contacts in other settings, we found that there was a fairly strong relationship with Google mobility indices. So for work contacts, um, a sort of almost linear relationship with workplace visits as recorded by Google. And for other contacts, this sort of hockey stick shaped um, kind of nonlinear relationship, um, bit, which mapped well to a kind of weighted uh, combination of transit station visits, retail and recreation visits. And grocery and pharmacy visits. So this is what we kind of ended up using um, in order to kind of set those contact rates. And then finally, uh, we had to make some, some tweaks using this sort of transmission adjustment parameter. So just mapping the contact rates through this kind of Google Mobility COMIX mapping wasn't quite enough to totally capture all the changes in transmission over the pandemic. So we used a particle filter in order to fit the kind of residual of um, what transmission changes would be necessary in order to fit the observed data, which I'll show on the next slide. And this kind of shows the, the features of that. Here I've highlighted lockdowns one, two, and three, as well as steps one to four of the roadmap. And you can just see over time what the model sort of decides is the um, excess sort of transmission rate over time. Um, the main notable feature here is a big spike right before Christmas. Um, we did not see a big spike at, at the sort of Euros 2020. Um, well, there's maybe a little one here, but um, that probably indicates that actually the Google mobility um, indices are, are sort of capturing well the, the contact patterns around that time. And then for projecting into the future, we use like an autoregressive model fitted to this um, prior bit of transmission adjustment to kind of generate random uh, paths for um, transmission adjustments into the future. So that's how we did it. Our model is fitted to a, a number of data sources, including um, infections from the ONS, hospitalizations, uh, ICU bed occupancy, uh, and deaths, and um, vaccine information is also in the model as well. Um, so you can see that, you know, using these two uh, data sources together, the contact rates um, with the sort of transmission adjustment um, does allow us to capture the dynamics of the epidemic quite nicely. So um, it's hard to read these labels, but these are the seven regions of England that we model. And this is showing the model fit to deaths, hospital admissions, beds occupied, and, and ICU beds occupied. So that's kind of how it works. And I'll, I'll just spend uh, a few minutes now just going over sort of how we used this sort of system to um, inform the roadmap modeling over time. So the first round of the roadmap that we got into was prior to step two. And uh, we had to sort of decide how contact rates might change uh, over time at each of these following steps. So the dashed lines here show like putative changes at steps uh, 1B, uh, step two, step three, and step four. And you know we, we kind of basically made, uh, we did our best to just make guesses essentially at how much um, mobility would change at each of these step, uh, in each of these um, venues at each step. So grocery and pharmacy, retail, recreation, transit, workplaces. And we assumed schools would just follow the normal school calendar. So based on that, we were able to build these different um, mobility scenarios with a kind of high, medium, and low projection for how mobility might change and produce these kind of um, plots showing the sort of projected 
um, burden in terms of uh, here we have bed occupancy for hospitals and deaths, depending on how mobility might change. And that's that's kind of the program that we stuck to for all the um, other stages of the lockdown. So when we got to when step two had been done, we sort of projected forwards with some assumptions around what steps three and four would do and produced again these high, medium and low scenarios. Uh, at step four, we did a similar thing again, projecting forwards what we thought might happen at step four, and this time with like a sort of large number of potential different scenarios, as the government at that time was interested in, they kind of made it known that they were thinking about maybe delaying um, step four, um, because at that point sort of Delta had emerged and um, there was quite a strong worry that it might be kind of a replay of, of what had happened with Alpha. So we looked at you know a two week delay, a five week delay, delay until all individuals were fully vaccinated. Um, we're doing like half of step four as scheduled and then the other half later and so on. Um, this is sort of our projections for if um, step four wasn't delayed. And what was concerning about this is that it was showing under the sort of high mobility assumptions. So the most pessimistic assumptions about behavior that we might get a substantial uh, wave of of, uh, of infections, of, of hospital admissions and deaths due to the emergence of the Delta variant and this increase in, um, in, in contact rates. So in response to this finding and also the, the sort of comparative result that bringing in like a delay of two weeks or of five weeks would be beneficial. Um, and this wasn't just our work, this was also the work of uh, uh, teams at Warwick and Imperial College, um, the government decided to, to not go ahead with step four immediately, but delay it for, I think, four weeks in the end was what they chose. Um, and then finally, we, we followed a similar procedure to produce scenarios for the autumn and winter. So again, looking at different rates of the eventual return to baseline levels of behavior and how this might impact on, on infections, admissions, and deaths. So. I guess my overall thoughts are that uh, you know mobility metrics can be used to model behavior, and they can simplify um, specifying future changes to behavior. Because when we we sort of project these scenarios in terms of um, slightly easier to understand quantities like the rate of workplace visits, the rate of retail and recreation visits, that can be a lot simpler than just thinking about how um, policies might impact upon like R the R number directly. So we found that to be an advantage of this approach. Um, high quality contact surveys are needed though to calibrate um, the impact of, of changes to mobility in terms of contact rates. Um, so you know the COMIC survey, we, we definitely couldn't have done this work without using that as, as the kind of underlying uh, mechanistic link between mobility and contact rates. And those aren't necessarily uh, you know, linearly related to each other as we found. Um, and finally, that you know, these simple scenarios uh, where we look at sort of high, medium, or low changes to mobility um, are useful for capturing uncertainty in, in these uh, scenario projections. I'll just end by thanking uh, Rosie, Mark, and John, um, the other uh, team members who, who did this work, and uh, members of SPIM for very helpful discussion throughout the pandemic. Thanks. Thank you, Nick. Thanks for your great talk. Um, and yeah, let's open up for maybe uh, just a few questions uh, before Sophie's talk. Um, or we can just carry this, the questions over until the discussion session. Um, oh, yeah, we do have a question from Christopher Watts. Please, please do unmute. Um, yeah, um, with the Google mobility data, um, what we're looking at there is sort of uh, um, uh, aggregate uh, values over time. Um, I, I'm just wondering, um, does Google give you um, much information about uh, the, the distribution around those aggregate values? Um, uh, so uh, for example, yes, is 80% uh, um, of the contacts coming from 10% 10, 10 of the people kind of thing? Yeah, there's, there's no information on that at all in Google data, and we just use the public data. Um, we've kind of asked them if they would give us a bit more detail, but they, they refused. Um, so it's not split out by age. It's not um, split out by 
um, as you say, like people's propensity for contact rates. We did investigate um, making assumptions around how the contact rates were distributed by age. So like early on in the pandemic, right, there was this policy of um, shielding the elderly, for example. But it turns out that when we looked at COMIX data, um, it didn't seem like, like um, older people were actually reducing their contacts any more proportionally than, than younger people. So we kind of decided that was, that was close enough. Um, but I think you're raising a really good point. So the impact of, of um, you I'm know- thinking of the analogy with the, uh, the network studies that were done a few years ago, yeah, where they showed, yeah, um, if you had a, a long tail degree distribution in, in your network, um, uh, that was actually quite important um, uh, for, uh, yes, raising the, uh, um, the overall uh, in fact, uh, epidemic risk. Uh, yeah, no, completely. I think this is an understudied area, actually, you know, and there have been some interesting papers out on the potential impact of heterogeneity and contact rates um, uh, during the pandemic, but uh, it hasn't really been uh, thoroughly investigated. I think this is one area where um, the COMIX survey can be really useful because it does actually capture that heterogeneity in, in contact rates, but it's not something we've, we've investigated.